you might be wondering why capital in the 21st century by Mr. Piketty, uh, Thomas Piketty, a 700-page treatise on the long-term trends in inequality, is so popular. And we were shocked to hear about this, uh, that, that a book about counter, well, subversion of economics is really, this book is about uh, justifying government intervention. It's, it's really a way of justifying the use of violence to control the distribution of resources. That's what this comes down to. And the reason it's so popular is because, well, libertarians are right about economics. I mean, there are two, there are two kinds of people in the world, libertarians and people that don't understand economics. Really that simple. So when there are people who want to use violence to control the flow of goods and services in the economy, who want to use the violence of government to exploit us, to make the rich richer and the poor poor, which is really what government is for and always has been, when they, when, and, and there are plenty of lackeys and there are plenty of delusional liberals who fall into this line and feed into this, this narrative from government, the reason that this book is so popular is because they're going, oh, we've got 700 pages of graphs. Libertarians are wrong. Violence is good. That's what it comes down to. The title of the story from Lynn Stewart Paramore at Alternet is Piketty Shrugged, How the French Economist Dashed Libertarians' Ayn Randian Fantasies. Capital in the 21st Century reveals once and for all that the invisible hand of the market can't solve inequality. Now, if you just understood what these words meant, okay, first of all, libertarians' Ayn Randian fantasies. Ayn Rand was not a libertarian. She was an objectivist and had her own horrible conclusions from that, all right? Great conflation of terms, misunderstanding, deliberate misrepresentation of what's going on. So reveals once and for all, the invisible hand of the market can't solve inequality. And again, this, this idea of inequality, I mean, she gets into this, but it, it is really absurd. Libertarians have always been flummoxed by inequality, tending either to deny that it's a problem or pretend that the invisible hand of the market will wave a magic wand to cure it. Well, thanks for collectivizing us and then misrepresenting us, or at least me, but really, I've never been flummoxed by inequality. I've always understood that the greatest inequality is created by government. Yeah, billion dollar handouts to corporations and banksters. No shit. And I've never, pro I've never tried to pretend that the invisible hand of the market will wave a magic wand to cure it. But if the invisible hand of the market is people interacting peacefully, I would suggest very strongly that peaceful solutions are gonna be superior to violent coercive solutions but that doesn't stop these propagandists from going on. And I, I really wonder if, if uh, Lynn Stewart Paramore here really believes in this stuff or if they're just getting like paid off to, 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 to regurgitate this obscene propaganda. Then everybody gets properly rewarded for what he or she does with brains and effort and things are peachy keen, except that they aren't, as exhaustively demonstrated by French economist Thomas Piketty, whose 700-page treatise on the long-term trends in inequality capital in the 21st century has blown up libertarian fantasies one by one. I don't, even, I don't even know where to start on just how absurd this is. To understand the libertarian view of inequality, let's turn to Milton Friedman, also not a libertarian. One of America's most famous and influential makers of free market mythology. Also one of the great subversions, uh, subverters of it as a proponent of central banks. Friedman declared, decreed that economic policy should focus on freedom and not equality. If we could do that, he promised, we'd not only get freedom and efficiency, but more equality as a natural byproduct. Libertarians who took the lessons from his books like Capitalism and Freedom and Free to Choose bought into the notion that capitalism naturally le led to less inequality. No, it's not that capitalism leads to less inequality. It's that having a government that has the power to steal from everyone as much as it wants and is trusted with all the guns to limit itself is going to create more inequality because it always ends up being the army of the super class, the army of the super rich used to exploit everybody else. Basically, the lessons boil down to this. Some degree of inequality is both unavoidable and desirable in free market, and income inequality in the U.S. isn't very pronounced anyway. And, and again, this is, this is kind of... Uh, I mean, no, income in the inequality in the U.S. is extremely pronounced. Uh, and, and it is pronounced because there are a lot of assholes getting rich off of government. Because the, the banking class keeps getting bailed out because Wall Street keeps getting paid off. Because the military industrial complex gets trillions of dollars from government for fucking people up. Like, it, it, like this, this, this uh, conflation of that with the, with the free market is, is insane. But the, the idea of equality, I mean, we do have to dismantle this as a false idea. Like, if you say, I want equality, and I'm going to use the force of government to impose it on people, like, even if you're well-intentioned enough in that, 
you're saying that I'm going to determine what you want. I'm going to determine what's going to make you happy. That a certain number of dollars is, is going to be good for you. This whole concept of equality is an absurd false contract when only you can decide for yourself what's going to make you happy in the first place. So libertarians, starting with these ideas, tend to reject any government intervention means to decrease inequality, can't claiming that such plans make people lazy and they won't work anyway. Uh, no, it's not that they make people lazy, it's that theft is wrong. Yeah, how about that? Theft at the, and, and theft by government is theft with the promise of murder at the end if you resist. So yeah, threatening people with death to steal from them in the name of equality, yeah, that's wrong. That doesn't work. Things like progressive income taxes, minimum wage laws, and social safety nets make most libertarians very unhappy. Uncle Mitty put it like this. A society that puts equality in the sense of equality of outcome ahead of freedom will end up with neither equality nor freedom. On the other hand, a society that puts freedom first will as a happy byproduct end up with both greater freedom and greater equality. Simple enough. Well, that turns out to be spectacularly, draw-droppingly, head-scratchingly wrong. Is this just like a fancy ad hominem to get you to stop thinking? The U.S. is now a stunningly unequal society with wealth piling up at the top so fast that an entire movement Occupy Wall Street sprung up to decry it with the catchphrase, we are the 99%. <sighs> Did you ever stop to ask why there's such inequality in the United States? Did you ever look at, like, how people get rich in the United States? And yes, some people get rich by actually serving people, but the reason they get so rich more than they should is because of corporatism, because government protects them from competition, because of bailouts, because of the banks. How did libertarians get it all so backwards? Well, <laughs> it wasn't from reading common sense, straightforward arguments that avoided such fall fallacious, ridiculous uh, red herrings as, as this. Well, as Piketty points out, people like Milton Friedman were writing at a time when inequality was indeed less pronounced than it had been in previous eras, but they mistook the happy state of affairs as the magic of capitalism. Actually, it wasn't the magic of capitalism that reduced inequality during a brief halcyon period during the New Deal in World War II. It was the forces of various economic shocks plus policies our government put in place to respond to them that changed America from a top-heavy society in the Gilded Age to something more egalitarian in the post-war years. As you'll recall, if you watched the movie Titanic, the U.S. had a class of rentiers, rich people who live off property investments in the early part of the 20th century, who hailed from places like Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. They were just as nasty and rapacious as their European counterparts, only there weren't quite so many of them and their wealth was not quite as concentrated. The southern rentiers had been wiped out by the Civil War. And again, you want to blame slavery as a source of income inequality? Yeah, go for it. It was a violent government policy. Slavery was not possible with the government protecting the rights of slave owners. Rights of slave owners. The fortunes of these rentiers were not shockproof. If you remember, ah, yada, yada, all sorts of meaningless historical stuff going into this. As Piketty notes, people like Friedman and academic economists were doing rather well in the economy, like sitting in the top 10% income level. And to them, the economy appeared to be doing just fine and rewarding talents and merits very nicely. But the Freedmans weren't paying enough attention to how the folks on the rungs above them, particularly the 1% and even more so, 0.01%, were beginning to climb into the stratosphere. The people doing that climbing were mostly not academic economists or lawyers or doctors. They were managers of large firms who had begun to award themselves very prodigious salaries. The phenomenon really got going after 1980 when wealth started flowing in vast quantities from the bottom 90% of the population to the top 10% of the population. Did you stop to ask how, perhaps? Lynn? Jeez. By 1987, Ayn Rand acolyte Alan Greenspan had taken over as head of the Federal Reserve, and free market fever was unleashed upon America. People in U.S. business school started reading Ayn Rand's kooky novels, as if they were serious economic treatises and hailing the free market as the only path to progress. John Galt captured the imaginations of young students like Paul Ryan, who worshipped Galt as a superman who could rise to the top through his vision, merit, and heroic efforts. He became, became the prototype of the kind of super manager these business schools were supposed to crank out. So, I, I mean, I don't even want to get into to any more of this because it's, it's really just uh, more economic diversion. And these arguments, if you, if, if you have like any critical thought capacity at all, it's really obvious when someone goes, well... You know, there's a problem, therefore my solution has to be the right one. And uh, those other guys, well, nanny nanny boo boo, they're a bunch of stupid heads. Which brings us back to Friedman's view that people naturally get what they deserve. That reward is based on talent. Well, clearly in the case of inherited property, reward is not based on tal talent, but membership in the lucky sperm club or marriage into it. That made Uncle Midia a bit, little bit uncomfortable, but he just huffed that life is not fair and we shouldn't think about it 
any more unjust than that one person is born with a mathematical genius as the other is born with a fortune. What's the difference? Actually, there is a very big difference. And again, the red herring of the inheritance argument doesn't change the reality here. It is the particular rules governing society that determine who amasses a fortune, what part of that fortune is passed on to heirs. The wrong-headed policies promoted by libertarians in their ilk, who hate any form of tax on the rich, such as inheritance taxes, have ensured that big fortunes in America are getting bigger, and they will play a much more prominent role in the direction of our society and economy if we continue on the present path. No, it's the occupiers, it's the libtards, it's the people like you who don't understand economics who are making the rich richer and the poor poor, because you keep asking government for the answer. Now, even if all of the economics and the practicality aside, What's really important here is what do you want? Are you, do, you, do you want a materially equal equality you know, society? Do you want to use the guns of government to forcefully redistribute wealth so that everybody can be equal? Or would you rather have a society where we have peace, where nonviolence is the way, and that is respect, and we understand that that's the best way for prosperity, for everybody to be happy, as opposed to threatening people with violence and dealing with all these other consequences of war and the police state and politicians. But no, that doesn't stop Lynn's ridiculous argument. What we are headed for after several decades of free market mania is super inequality, possibly such that as the world has never seen. In this world, more and more wealth will be gained off the backs of the 99% and less and less will be earned through hard work, which essentially means freedom for the rich and no one else. And that's true, as long as we allow government to serve as the armies of the super class, ripping everybody off and don't take the time to think through these economic arguments and universally condemn any attempt to violently redistribute wealth. Appreciate the little sneak attack yet. You want to have a serious discussion about monetary policy? Get yourself prepared for the conversation. It starts with a global run on the banks. That's completely bonkers. The working class does not get hurt by inflation, 